Good morning, everyone. Okay, so that doesn't sound like everyone. And good morning again, everyone. Um, firstly, let me say it's a privilege to be here this morning, to be able to share God's word with you. Um, first of all, about the, oh, y'all can have a seat. My apology, I can have a seat. About the um, chicken stepper thing. <laughs> I, I couldn't let that one slide. I grew up on chicken steppers, right? And I am going to tell you that when done correctly, give me the chicken steppers and keep the bird. So yeah, I'm a chicken stepper father. I don't mind being a chicken stepper father. As a matter of fact, quite recently I had some chicken stepper soup. Yeah, I, I don't need to say anymore. I don't need to say another thing. Is everybody, is everybody okay today? Is everybody all right? Yeah, everybody's okay? All the men good? So the first thing I want to do even before I open my notes is to just bow your head with me, let me approach the throne of grace, please. Dear God and our Father, this is a tough one for me and you know why. I pray that you would speak to me, speak through me, and allow your people to be touched in Jesus' name. Amen. So it was made to understand that I don't have a lot of time, so I'm just going to stand up, speak up, and shut up so we can move on. Yeah. So I asked just now if everybody's okay. Everybody said, yeah, they're okay. But before I even get to the message that God had placed on my heart many, many, many years ago, I want to say something that may shock you people, especially men. Men, do you know that it's okay not to be okay? Let me say that one again, because I seem to have gone above some people's heads. I'm saying to you, are you aware that as a man, you don't always have to be okay? And today, I'm going to be honest with you, since I'm the person in the spotlight right now. I am not totally okay. The thing is that about a couple of weeks ago, uh, May 31st to be exact, while at a Lyme, I experienced an extremely traumatic experience, probably the most traumatic thing I've ever experienced in my life, and I've experienced some traumatic things. And I am telling you that I am not okay. But I find that sometimes as men, we seem to have this Superman complex. Let me tell you about Superman. Superman can fly into a burning building and save everybody in the burning building and come out smelling like roses. Superman can go in front of a speeding train and stop the train and don't even get a, 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 a road, what do you call the thing when you fall down, a burnout. And men seem to think that, that that is what it means to be a man. Can I tell somebody this morning that I'm here to change the narrative and let you know that it's okay not to to be okay that it's okay that when you run into this burning building to see somebody at some point in time you come out smelling like sat can I tell somebody that this morning it is okay not to be okay this morning I want to spend a few minutes though looking at what has grown over the years to be one of my favorite stories and it's taken from John chapter 11 but for the first couple minutes, I just want to look at verse 43 and 44. And it says, John chapter 11, 43 and 44. And for those of you who are following your Bibles, I'm going to be using the King James Version. Um, not that it's the preferred version, but for this particular story, there's a particular phrase that is used in the King James Version that is not used anywhere else. And for that reason, I opted to use the King James and 43 says, and when, he's, when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound with a napkin. And Jesus saith unto them, loose him, let him go on this morning for the next couple of minutes I want to speak to you on the topic 
of loose him. Many years ago, I watched, uh, I believe it was a movie that T.D. Jakes would have produced called Woman Thou Art Loose. And for the longest time, I thought to my mind, why is it that only women seem to need to be let loose? Men need to be let loose too. And that's why from then God put this message in my spirit. And each time that an opportunity came up for me to share it, something went wrong. So when, the, when Fabian brought the word that he was in, whether to speak and he started to get cold feet, I don't know why, because y'all heard Fabian already and he's an excellent speaker. And I'm quite certain that if he didn't have to give way to me, Fabian would still be here talking because he can talk. Fabian can talk. But Fabian also has the action to back the talk. And on that incident that you heard me speaking about a couple of Tuesday nights ago while I was in a &E and I came out, who do you think I saw outside concerned not, just, not just about me, but those who I was with, my girlfriend, and that opinion was Fabian. So he's not just a talker, he's an actor, he's a man that backs his word, and we need more men like that today. So we have Fabian, we have the money, and if you like these shirts, you got to big up the money, you got to take a minute to big up the money, and Nathan, and um, oh, oh, sorry, my apologies, my, my humblest apologies, I got to big up myself, and that's um, about the mask as well, yeah, yeah, we, we got some good men, and uh, tell me your name again, so I forget your name, Nathan, not, I got Nathan ready. Corinne, we got some good men. We got to take a minute to big up the men. But I just want you men to remember, and feel maybe we had this conversation at the last men's meeting, we aren't supermen. And I was trying to understand when the opportunity was given to me, and every time I went through the scriptures, I could feel the presence of God and the anointing of God upon me, and then this incident happened, and almost for full two weeks, I felt nothing. I tried to understand, why God, why? Why? And only just two days ago, God said to me, you can't have a testimony without a test. You can't have a testimony, and this is going to be hard, before the test. <sighs> mm. And I thought, to God, I said, God, this is one test I can feel. And God said, listen, you don't even have to pass the test. You just have to experience the test. And my daughter came and joined me. And funny enough, the next thing I want to say involves her. And it reminds me, of when she went in for her driver's license and she failed the first time and <laughs> and she told me that she failed and you want to know what when they went in for my driver's test the first time I failed now had I passed the first time when she failed I would not have had a what a testimony to share with her but because I went in and I failed and I understood what it meant to fail when you were doing everything right all along and even the driver instructor when you when I feel was surprised to know that I fail even then I had a testimony because I had a, a test now let's go back to the scripture in verse 1 of John chapter 11 verse 1 says a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and his sister Martha. It was Martha which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Now this confused me for a little bit because as I was reading John, I didn't read anything about Mary anointing the Lord at that point in time. So I had to skip forward a little bit to see what was going on because the story felt interesting to me. And then when I read that it was that Mary that anointed the Lord, I said, but wait, hold on. But I ain't read nothing yet about the Lord being anointed. So I skipped down a little bit and I realized that in John chapter 12, it then talks about six days before the Passover where Lazarus, 
Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was, which had been raised from the dead. You understand what I'm just telling you? That in John chapter 11, the writer makes reference to a situation that had not yet happened. And I say, well, this got to be something real special that can make this woman come and pour a whole, whole um, pound of ointment, costly ointment, and then wipe the feet with her hair. Something special went down. So I had to go back again quickly to see what was going on. So I went a little further. And in verse 3, it says, Therefore the sisters sent message unto him, Jesus, saying, Behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. And I had to pause again. Because you see, when it mentions the word love, I know that there's more than one type of love. And I'm thinking, what kind of love is this that the author here is talking about? Is it, is it um, agape love? What kind of love is it? And when I went back to the original source, I realized that they were talking about philia. And it talks about a love, a be, a love between brothers. Me, the meaning of it is a noun, and the meaning of it is beloved, dear, a friend, someone dearly loved. So when the message came to Jesus and said unto him, the one that you dearly love is sick, it drove me into even further confusion because then Jesus said because I love him I will delay now that hit me for six and I can tell you where it hit me for six remember I spoke to you about the incident Tuesday night the Tuesday night and I the, I don't want to think it was me that sent the message I think somebody that sent the message to Fabian and I know that Fabian loved me. Uh, but I don't think that Fabian loved me the way Jesus loved Lazarus. But when Fabian heard the word that we were at the hospital, Fabian left appointment that he was about to start and rush and come down. So when I read that Jesus loved Lazarus and Lazarus was sick, I was expecting to read next that Jesus left what he was doing to go. But Jesus loved Lazarus and delayed not a half an hour to wait for the bypass bus. Not a five minute because he didn't want to get in a particular ZR because the music was too loud. But he waited two days. No, that confused me. That confused me. But then I read, I read a little further and it said, that when Jesus said it, he said that the sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God. And I, I said, well, no, boy, I can't hear. And I scribbled a little further down. And I realized, no, mind you, Jesus said that this sickness is not unto death. But as I scroll a little further down, I realized, but Lazarus died. So this ain't making a sense to me. How you mean the sickness is not unto death, but yet Lazarus died? But then again, I went back to the original context. You see, because the English language is a funny thing. So sometimes you've got to go back to the original writing. And when it says that this sickness is not unto death, it didn't mean that Lazarus was not going to die. It meant that this story was not going to end in death. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. The story didn't end in death. And then furthermore, it went on to say, it is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. And I said to myself, hold on, though, Sean, hold on, hold on, hold on. You know where you need to pause? Because not every negative thing that you're going through got anything to do with you. Sometimes the thing that you're going through got to do with God. It ain't got nothing to do with you. You don't seem to believe me, so ask Job. Job got a message. All your, all your animals and things dead. What did Job do? Nothing. Job was a righteous man. Before he could get over that good, you know what you hear? All your family, all your children are thing dead. But behind the scenes, we recognize that Jesus, when God had a meeting with the sons of God, and, 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 and among them, Satan went and said, Have you considered my servant? 
Um, so he, he went to, to God and, uh, and, and basically pushed him himself. And God asked him, where did I come from? He said, from going to and fro upon the earth. And, and God asked him, have you considered my servant Job? And, and Satan said to God, but Job only doing good for you because you're blessing me. Take away these things and see what happens. So it says to me that that had absolutely nothing to do with Job, but there was a spiritual battle going on. And I want to say to men and women today, actually, that sometimes there's a spiritual battle going on, and you just get caught up in it, but it ain't got nothing to do with you. But it gives you a testimony, you know why? Because you had a test. And it had me confused. So I went a little further. I went a little further into this thing. Now Jesus loved Martha. Hear the thing. Jesus loved Martha. He loved the sister Mary. He loved Lazarus. But yet he abode two days. Now mind you, Bible theologians suggest that by the time the word reached Jesus in the first place, Lazarus had already died. By the time the word get to Jesus that he was sick, that Lazarus was sick. But I want to know if I want to know if I can just manipulate this story a little bit. Can I do that? Can I just take the sick out of context for a little bit? Because when I read that Lazarus Lazarus was sick, I thought to myself, suppose sick in this context could be used as a metaphor. Or in essence, suppose I was able to take it out from the original context and use it a little different to try to see if I can get to tell men a little story. To see if I can get to get men to a realization. What if sick wasn't physical sick, but some sick behaviors that men engage in? What if sick refer to husbands that leave the wise home and go in Nelson Street and the red light district and, and have sex with prostitutes and then go back home? What if sick refer to men like that? What if sick refer to men who take money meant for food and rent and bills and spend it on rum and, and, and drugs? Isn't that sick behavior? What if, what if sick men, men who refuse to support the children, they already got two and three children from two and three different women, and they refuse to support them ones, but they go and get somebody else pregnant, knowing they're going to turn around and do the same thing. Isn't that sick behavior? And if we be honest, if we be honest, some of us men guilty of these things. But then it goes a little further on and it says that not only was Lazarus sick, but eventually Lazarus died. So Jesus said to the disciples, he's sleeping. But I go that I may wake him up of his sleep. And somehow the disciples, like they may get it. So then in verse 12, the disciples said to him, but Lord, if he sleep, um, he shall do well. And, 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 and then the, the verse 10 says, How be it that Jesus spoke of death, but they thought he had spoken of rest and sleep. And then Jesus had to basically tell them straight off, Listen, Lazarus dead. So suppose, suppose again, that I took this word dead out of the original context of which it is written. And I bring it now back again to look at dead behaviors and some of the behaviors that men engage in that can be considered as if they morally and conscious was the word they're consciously dead what if we can look at some of those behaviors when a man could treat a woman like a punching bag and say to her at the end of the day i'm only beating you because i love you that kind of behavior is dead behavior when a man could tell his child mother because you know there's the thing of you know, the child mother in that's his child mother that the only way you can get money for the children is if you have sex with him that is dead behavior and when a man that knows the pampers need milk the child need milk and pampers and instead of assisting go and buy the latest brand name and go and indulge in all kind of thing when the child home suffering that 
is behavior that is associated with a dead conscience. These are dead behaviors. And to be honest with you, and if you're allowed to be honest, some of us men are guilty of these things. And I wish they could have stopped there, but it doesn't stop there. No, we didn't stop there because in verse 38, it goes on to say that when Jesus then eventually made his way to Bethany and he came on to the grave, now it was a cave, and there was a stone in front of it. And Jesus said, listen, roll away the stone. And Martha, the sister of him who was dead, Said after him, said after unto him, this is the Jesus now, Lord, by this time he stinketh because he had been dead for how long? Oh, you all know the story. For four days. And suppose then I pull this stink, this stench that more than likely by this time Lazarus had been experiencing. Suppose I pull that and look at some stink behaviors that men is being disengaged in. When men lure little boys and little girls into their cars and into their homes with sweets and treats and molest them, that is not sick behavior. That is not behavior of a man whose conscience is dead. That is stink behavior. When a man can shoot and stab and maim and kill other men and women and children and don't care about who innocent bystander gets in the way. I thought that my situation was bad, Fabian. Uh, but a guy was sharing with me um, his own situation and I want to phrase it very carefully, not to point specific in the body. Um, there was war between two neighboring communities. And this is in Bible. Let's talk about it now. And his nephew was outside, eight or something, say, oh, years old. And he saw the men coming from the one community to the other community that he's in with the guns. Little boy, eight years old, and know nothing much about guns. And furthermore, he tells the boys, the little boy is coming and doing nothing. And the men shot the little boy that was on the step playing with the toys on his way to the block. Eight years old. No, dying sick behavior, dying dead behavior. That is stink behavior. And when you got men that leave their wives and girlfriends and go and lay with other men as with a woman, and they're trying to put this very politically correct because they know we're in church and that kind of thing, and, and, and then come back home and wipe them out clean and get on as if nothing happened. That is not. Say it again, say it again. That is sick behavior. That is dead behavior. That is stink behavior and this left me real confused you know it left me real confused because i think to myself uh, somewhere along the line what what why wasn't some kind of intervention made with these men at uh, somewhere along the line why wasn't some type of intervention made with lazarus lazarus was sick why did jesus wait four days to raise lazarus when he already started to stink and, and, and God said to me, because you know why? I want you to realize. Now, female intelligence, now I social work training, counselor training. Like I do counseling on a daily basis. And God wanted me to realize that at the end of the counseling, at the end of the psychology, at the end of the psychiatry, if you want to get men back to the place you want them to be, at the end of all of that, you got to bring Jesus. At the end of, the, of all of that, the only way we're going to reclaim society, the only way we're going to reclaim men is to bring them back to God. 
and and when I when I look into this story some more, like I tell you, this story really excited me because I was real. I was wondering really what's going on here, and I realized that Jesus waited four days. Let me tell you. Back in those days, there was a belief that when somebody died, the spirit wandered for three days. If Jesus had intervened before, you know what they would say? It wasn't Jesus. It's just that the spirit didn't settle yet. So Jesus waited. <clears throat> Watch me now. Jesus waited until the social work failed. Jesus waited until the psychology failed. Jesus waited until the psychiatry failed. When the whole world up on Lazarus and say he ain't only sick, he ain't just dead, but he's sick. And Jesus walking. No. I, I want to borrow Nathan. Come, Nathan. I want to borrow Nathan. She never come. Come, on. come, Nathan. Because I want to paint this picture for y'all. See? I want to paint this picture for y'all. Because when Jesus went to the tomb, right? She going to wrap you up. Wrap up from the legs and I can't. I got enough cloth. Don't worry. Wrap it up. up good. You can open it. It's thick. Because you see the thing is, right? And that's what we want. That's what we want people to understand, right? When Jesus called forth Lazarus, he ain't come forth looking pretty. You see, when he died, right? They had wrapped him up. He ain't getting real yet. He ain't getting real yet. Don't worry. Come. Bring it wrong, bring it wrong. Yeah. This is the thing that we need to understand, right? <clears throat> when Jesus told Lazarus to come first, fourth before we get there, remember I told y'all that they had a, a stone in front of the tomb? Now, this is one thing that he always could never understand. Jesus, our powerful, got the ability to raise the man from the dead. You think that Jesus had the ability to move a, a big rock from in front of a tomb? I tell him I got enough cloth. When they feel the making sport, I tell him I have enough cloth. Jesus said, he said to the people, move the stone. What does that stone represent? That stone represents the, the limitations placed on men to stop them from aspiring to be the true men that God called them to be. So the first thing that Jesus said to the people, you know what he said to the people? Because the People is who put the stone there. Society is who put the stone there and tell men sticks and stone. What is um, snips and snails and poppy dog tails? This is what men are made of. And I, I hear today to tell them true. That is not true. So they had to move the stone. I want you to go back a little bit, right? All right, come in a little closer there. Like, see? So when Jesus said to Lazarus, because he moved the stone, when Jesus said to Lazarus, Lazarus come forth, Lazarus ain't come forth looking pretty. And I want you all to understand this, and this is what I want men to get in the head. That when God call you, you may not always come out looking rose like Superman. You're going to come out smelling like sun. You're going to be able to, be able to, be able to move. If, can you move as freely as if you were not anything? No. But this is the part that really got me. Jesus looked at the men. Now, before I get there, let me go back a little bit again. Be, 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 be saying myself. In 43, Jesus said, and he said in a low voice, Lazarus, come forth. Now, I believe that if Jesus had not called the name Lazarus and had just said, come forth. 
it would have had real tombs open in that day. Enough dead would have been coming forth. But Jesus came to Lazarus, who was once sick, who was once dead, who was beginning to stink, who the psychologists couldn't get through, the social workers couldn't get through, the psychiatrists couldn't get through. Jesus came and said, Lazarus, come forth. Today I want to say to the men of St. George, today I want to say to the men of Mainz, today I want to say to Nathan, to Fabian, to Damien, to, to myself, to all the men, come forth. God is calling forth. God is calling for something special, something powerful. Come forth. Listen. I ain't care how you look. You don't have to be dressed nicely and neatly. It can be wrapped in the things that wrap you up into mommy for you. Come forth. But then this is what Jesus said that I love because I was still confused. And I tell you, this scripture had me confused for a while. And then Jesus said to the people, loose him. Loose him. Loose him. And I wonder why would Jesus say to loose him? Jesus said to them, loose him. I heard a tele evangelist speaking about the challenges that she was having with her husband. And an elderly woman in the church said to her one day, do you know why you continue to get challenges with your husband? Because every Sunday you get here and knock your husband. You keeping your husband wrapped with your words start to speak positive things into your husband's life within months the reason why men are still sick one of the reasons why men I ain't gonna take all the blame off of men but one of the reasons why men are still sick one of the reasons why men are still dead one of the reasons why men still stink is because we still treat them like sick, dead, stinking minded men. We need to loose them. We need to loose the men. Loose the man. Let him be the man that God wants him to be. We need to loose him. All these labels that we got on men, I heard the pastor some this morning. No good. No good. You ain't no good. You're just like your father. We need to loose these men. Let the man be. Let the man be. We need to lose the man. Now, this is the part that hit me hard. When God spoke this message into my soul and my spirit. Because I lose him. But one of the things that hold men in place, there's nothing that can hold a man in place greater than his own thought about himself. Nathan, I just lose you as uh, some of the baggage, some of the labels, some of the things that people put upon you. You still wrap up. Will you still wrap up? Because you're going to lose yourself. Lose yourself, Nathan. Lose yourself, boy. And be become the man that God wants you to be. Lose yourself. This is who God calls us to be. Men, I say to you today, be loose. Loose them. Let them be what God has them to be. Stand up. I told you to stand up, speak up, and shut up, right? <laughs>